from the International Educational Development Program at the Graduate School of Education. And uh, you are at our uh, visiting speaker series with Dr. Joshua Muskin as the visiting speaker today. Um, as some of you know, it's a particular pleasure to uh, have Jack Muskin be our speaker today. He is a Penn alum and PhD. I uh, had the privilege uh, quite some time ago of being here on his dissertation committee. And uh, I've also had the pleasure, as I will have with many students in IDP, of watching your trajectory, your experiences over time. But with Josh, I've had, since he got his PhD in 1991, that makes at least, I uh, can't do that math really that quickly. But a lot of years. A lot of years of time watching uh, him progress. So um, I have actually a bio sketch that I'm only going to read the first line of. And I'm going to say a few other remarks. But the first line goes like this. Uh, uh, Joshua Muskin, who is now uh, the, uh, is it deputy director? S senior program officer. Senior program officer in education at the Otto Kahn Foundation based in Switzerland has worked in international development and international education for nearly 30 years, combining in-country project delivery with international program oversight and supervision with both technical and managerial functions. Now, when I say a sentence like that, which is taken directly from his bio sketch, uh, it is exactly the opposite in tone of who Josh Muscle is. <laughs> he is one of the most dynamic least uh, mired in managerial, whatever it says, functions person that I know. Uh, he epitomizes, I think, the kind of image we would like to have of people who work mainly in the nonprofit sector who don't mind, uh, as they say, uh, breaking eggs in order to make an omelet. Uh, and I've had an opportunity to see that. I mean that in a very positive way, but of course, when you are a person like that, uh, you sometimes find yourself moving from one position to another uh, rather than staying for 40 years in a single spot. So I will take this opportunity to read some of the highlights of places he has been and gone. Some of you who are interested in working in international education might find this of interest. I hope that you all will. Uh, so just starting um, on this list that uh, he did not know I was going to read, I'm going to read. Uh, so, USAID Education Senegal, USAID Education Djibouti, uh, UNDP Conflict Resolution in Cyprus, Save the Children in Haiti, uh, Catholic Relief Services in Burkina Faso, Inter-American Development Bank, uh, Haiti, Haiti. Uh, World Bank, uh, Lead Researcher Chad, Institute for Policy Reform, uh, Mali, Institute for, uh, International Institute for Research, uh, Mali again, World Bank, Mali, three in a row. <laughs> um, bingo. No, not bingo yet. Oh. Um, EDC, oh, you're right. EDC, Mali. <laughs> UNICEF, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, Americans for Indian Opportunity. Albuquerque. Uh, Albuquerque. And, uh, and so much more. So uh, that just gives you a sense of the diverse kinds of experiences had. Um, I want to say one more thing. Um, when Josh Muskin got his degree here, um, we thought he would be going into academia as his main occupation, and he did. He went to Florida State University, was an assistant professor there for a while, for a number of years, and then left to do many of these kinds of international activities. And I think in some ways, uh, he epitomizes the kind of graduates and PhDs we would like to have at the University of Pennsylvania. A little bit like Amy Gutman, the president of Penn, likes to say, you know, engagement, global engagement, local engagement, people who can understand the evidence, who can understand the research, who can do the research, and also understand how to get things done on the ground. And um, I know this uh, from my own personal experience observing him in the field, and I know we will be uh, interested today to hear what he is going to talk about in terms of teachers 
I'm so glad you're back on campus again, Josh. You've got to do that on the rock. Welcome back to the Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Dan. Just need to make this visible so I don't spend all the time looking backwards. Is this okay? Okay. So thank you, Dan, for those kind words. It's, I hope that you all are able to maintain the sorts of relationships with your professors, including Dan, that I've been able to have over the years. I continue to learn from him. And it's nice to be in a reciprocal relationship where I can do some more teaching of him, too, because he's still got things to learn as well, as do we all. Um, I want to talk about getting education right, because that's what we're all talking about, whether it's the current EFA, post-EFA discussions, whether it's a race to the top here in the United States, or the new reforms that we're dealing with in Switzerland, where I live now with my family. And education is in constant revision and reform. I was talking with some folks earlier who were talking, who were uh, referring to master teachers or older teachers where they'd been and how the new teachers would get all excited about new ideas being come, that were coming into the school, get all nervous about it. And the older teacher said, wait two years. There'll be something new. Let's not get worried about it. Something new will come. And so we're always talking about new pedagogy methods, uh, organization of teaching, the materials used in teaching. This presentation will be available to you, so be parsimonious in your note taking. You don't have to copy this down, okay? Um, testing, what we're testing, how we're testing, when, why. Curriculum, what's the content, what are the curricular objectives, standards, materials used, management, who's managing, how we're managing, what are the inputs, who's responsible for what, centralized, decentralized, school run, uh, district run. Teachers, how are we recruiting them, where are we recruiting them, what kind of training are we giving to them, roles, assessment. Other things, whether it be how parents are involved, communities involved, calendar, other policy issues, always being bombarded with newness to get education right. And with this constantly moving feast, we find teachers on the front lines. They're the ones who have to make this happen, bearing the full weight of implementation, although the students are the ones who are bearing the full weight, weight of the risks or the, the effects. So with these new ideas constantly coming into the game, we're concerned by a crucial question. How do these great, or sometimes less than great, and I'm thinking of things like No Child Left Behind, just for example, how do these great new ideas in education become good universal practice in the classroom? Okay. An education system is obligated to work for homogeneity. It's working way at the top of the system. It has to pay equal attention so that all kids get the best education possible. So they're looking at homogeneity across processes, across the products we use in education, and the outcomes we expect for education. But the challenge is that classrooms are defined by homogeneity. Okay? In, or I'm sorry, by heterogeneity, okay? Um, and I like to say, in, if any one solution, once it gets a new technology, some sort of innovation, some new policy or textbook, when it gets into the hands of 10,000 teachers, it becomes 10,000 reforms. Now, systems are usually terrified by this and do everything in their power to control this this heterogeneity, all right? What I contend is that we need to embrace the heterogeneity. This is where the strength of an education system comes. But we need to nurture it and we need to monitor it, okay? We're not talking anarchy here, okay? We're talking guardrails, all right? Not tracks, but guardrails. Okay, in my work, in the different countries where I operate. I like to ask teachers, school managers, up to ministers of education, 
to think about the teachers who affected you most, who in your present day work, your private life, your professional lives, who have had the greatest influence on you? Okay, think back. You probably have a couple names of teachers. Were they the ones who followed the rules? Followed the text exactly, did exactly what they were told, what I call the conformists? Or were they the creative rule benders? <laughs> what I call the rebels, okay? Almost without exception, whether I'm in North Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, Africa, or Sub-Saharan Africa, people will think in their minds, they'll conjure up the rebels, right? Why are we creating systems that expect every teacher to be the same? Rather, we need a different answer for every teacher. Why? Because every teacher is different. And every child that they're working with are different. Whether because of their personal traits or because of contextual factors. Okay? If we're talking personal traits, different content knowledge, different ex personal experiences, professional experiences, different pedagogic, uh, different aspects of their pedagogy where they feel more comfortable different personal interests and talents, different personalities, different networks, et cetera, okay? So if you ask a teacher to be strong at something and that something goes against their comfort zone or their interests, then you're compromising the ability of that teacher to be engaged, to feel a sense of responsibility or ownership, and to be effective. Whereas if you give them the opportunity to bring their own personal interest. You now some teachers are very kinetic and can be effective working with their students in a kinetic way. Some are very cerebral, but can get students energized cerebrally because that's where they're comfortable, that's where they're excited themselves, and that's where they can excite others. The contextual factors for teachers and the students, school facilities and resources are different from one school to the next, socioeconomic settings change, local culture, local ecology, family assets, all different types, etc. Now we're not talking just about constraints here. What I prefer to talk about are these as assets assets that communities bring, assets that teachers bring, assets that students bring to the learning environment, to the learning process. And rather than stifle them with a very rigid set of, of uh, pedagogic methods, very rigid texts and curricula, very rigid assessment mechanisms, give teachers the opportunity to capitalize on the assets that they bring, that the environment provides to them, that their students bring. When we're bringing newness to the classroom, to the school, we need to help teachers not just do it, but to adapt it and adopt it. Okay? So how do teachers learn and improve? We take our teachers, and I'm thinking mostly developing country settings, but it's familiar for those of us here in the States too. Send them off to teacher training college. They learn education theory and history, pedagogic theory, and subject content. Then we send them off to the classroom where they enter their classrooms and they start working. Pretty much in isolation, at least in the context where I'm working. Okay, and I'm sure this comes to your, I mean, this is familiar with your own experience. And in my experience, I taught for three years out of undergrad. Now what do I do? Okay, I learned all this stuff. Now how do I do it? And if I'm alone in my classroom, I have very little opportunity to start working on this other than just conjuring my own, summoning my own imagination to try to figure out how to fit in. And this is, it's not unique to education. I was telling the a group earlier when I went off to Sudan 
I would save the children uh, a year out of my master's program. Literally, within a week, I was writing a letter back to my lead master's professor saying, I learned everything about what not to do in development at Penn, but I didn't learn what to do. Okay, so your education doesn't stop when you get your diploma. How do systems help teachers adapt and succeed once they're in the classroom? Okay, the classic system. They work at the, mini at the ministry level, what do they do you know, nationwide, and what do they do at the local level? At the national level, they provide them with pedagogic technology, which is not just hardware but the software, pedagogic innovation, national training, curriculum and texts, policy and planning, standards and assessment tools. These are all aspects that the ministry conjures up to help teachers know what to do to teach effectively, to make sure their students are learning. Okay, that's a big distance between what they're doing at the central level. I'd like to uh, you know, think just very concretely, you have top experts, university, uh, uh, education leaders, scientists, all these things, spending two years coming up with a new curriculum or a new textbook or a new pedagogic approach. They experiment with it in a handful of schools, they get it approved, and then they spend two weeks teaching the teacher trainers. And then those teacher trainers have two days with the teachers who have no sense coming into this of what's behind it. So you go from two years of the, I'm you know, maybe exaggerating a little bit, but think of two years with the experts down to due days for the teachers, and how are they supposed to master this to be able to put it into the effective practice that it was designed to develop. At the local level, you've got in-service training, which happens in most of the countries where I work, maybe once a year, sometimes twice a year, not for all teachers. In-class inspection, which again, I know teachers who haven't had an inspector visit them for two years. Cluster training, putting several schools together to interact with each other with key resource teachers or mentor teachers, key teacher, uh, key resource teacher mentoring in the school, et cetera. Okay, so at the local level, you've got these things happening, which are also tend to be discrete, narrowly targeted, intermittent, and infrequent. And what I haven't written in, written in here is that they also tend to be one-off events. So I, I talk about the checklist approach to training. Okay, continuous assessment, two-day training, check. Now, large class management, two-day training, check, with no checking on how the teachers did with it, whether they really understood it, whether they're translating it well into practice in the classroom. So how can professional development improve teachers and education quality in a constant way, in a routine way? How can we as systems and as partners of education systems engage teachers actively on a frequent and regular basis to consult, cooperate, and collaborate to adapt and adopt new pedagogies, curriculum materials, et cetera, to improve their individual practice and their practice as a group of educators to strengthen student learning, okay? How do we make it regular, constant, and evolutionary, progressive, okay? No more checklists. What we're working on at the Aga Khan Foundation, what I worked on previously in the project I led in Morocco, we're talking about something that we refer to as education communities of practice. The notion, as best I can trace it, goes to uh, two Swiss uh, researchers, educators, Wenger and Lav, L-A-V-E, uh, who wrote about this in, I think in the, it traces back to the early 90s. That's where I can find references to communities, education communities of practice. It's not something that I invented, I promise. 
What we're proposing is to balance systemic innovation and training with innovation and training at the classroom, school, and cluster levels. Okay? Bringing in new curriculum, new materials and texts, new standards, new technologies, new pedagogy. I'm not saying that teachers need to create this. Okay, we're not asking them to invent it. Although, if they do, that's a good thing. There's this new book that I've just or, or just received, I heard about on the Diane Rehm show, uh, World Peace and Other Fourth Grade Achievements. Has anyone heard of this or read it yet? I think his name's John Hunter. Um, but he's, and there are other educators that get these prizes and stuff and gets uh, foundation support and the like for inventing new pedagogy and the like. We're not asking all teachers to be able to do that. We recognize that effective practice requires that the system help introduce innovation and the material supports to innovation into the system. Okay, and that comes from the broader system, the ministry level, and that the local level then has the responsibility to train it. Cascade training, okay? It's been, there's a lot of critique, criticism of cascade training, and I criticize it. But I think that it has an important role to playing, introducing innovation into the classroom, into school, into the classroom, but we can't stop there. We need for teachers to be able to work with this, to learn about it from their experience and to work within their schools and with other schools to churn it as an idea and take ownership of it so that it takes the form that they feel comfortable with and that's adapted to the environment in which they're working. Okay? If you build a new curriculum or a new, uh, yeah, a new curriculum on textbooks, and those textbooks aren't in the classroom, then you need to come up with something new. And the other part of the communities of practice is what this churning and this experience does in terms of strengthening the models themselves and how the models are used. So this feedback from the teacher back up to the system is a vitally important part of the whole process. And you need to be able to have the opportunities for the people responsible at the higher levels to learn from what's happening in the classroom. And I can talk more about that later from uh, very practical experiences of introducing new pedagogies or new models into practice in, in Morocco. Okay, so I'd like to illustrate this a little bit from a recent uh, trip that I took to Tajikistan. And I'm gonna talk one about one particular innovation, which uh, is I call relevance pedagogy. And this also, this is something that we're working on right now in Tajikistan. It also relates to the five-year project in, in Morocco. And then the second bit is the process of adoption. So I want to talk a little bit about these, and I'll do it in order. Okay, so relevance pedagogy is a pedagogy designed to improve teaching and learning the official curriculum by enriching lessons with knowledge and skills drawn from the local or the broader setting. Right, this is the notion that two plus two doesn't just equal four. And in fact, two plus two sometimes does not equal four. For example, if you're a, a carpenter, and you get out your saw, and you measure two inches, and two inches, and you cut those pieces along the line, you're gonna end up with something less than four, right? Because the saw consumes part of that distance, right? So learning in a way that allows you to experience those abstract notions one, helps you understand the abstract notions better, but two, helps you use them in a way, in a flexible way, so that you can be more successful in a variety of practices. If you measure out two milliliters, you're giving your child some medicine, and it's a very viscous medicine. You know that if you measure just to the two milliliter point, 
your child's not going to get the full two milliliters of medication. Now, that probably doesn't matter. I've never worried about measuring that so that my child gets just the right amount of child's, children's Tylenol. There are three fundamental domains that I refer to in relevance pedagogy. The one is pedagogic, and I'm not, you know, there's some people who may quibble with my use of the phrases here, but just let me explain them and understand that that's what I mean by them. So when I talk about pedagogic, the pedagogic domain, I'm talking about the full range of learning objectives for competent graduates. What are we expecting kids or graduates to be able to know and know to do when they complete their education process. Thematic, what are the topics from the local physical, social, economic, and cultural context that feed into the relevance uh, agenda? And then methodological, the pedagogic strategies we use to achieve the learning objectives, okay? So if we look at the pedagogic, the learning objectives I divide across academic knowledge, what you need to learn what the ministry is expecting of you in terms of content and academic skills, and then the other side are skills and behaviors. Okay, academic knowledge includes information, it includes background information, techniques, like reading and writing, math, from math calculations, the sorts of things you need to know to pass the tests. Okay? On the skills and behavior side, we're talking about both local skills and personal skills and behavior. The local skills are things like household knowledge and activities, production, economic production, Sociocultural sorts of things, uh, whether it be you know Quranic education or Poro uh, initiation sorts of things into uh, life. Okay, um, on the personal side, I've I divided into four broad categories: uh, learning, problem solving, teamwork and communication. Okay, these are the sort of things that Penn's new MacArthur Genius Award recipient, Angela Duckworth, is working with. Okay, learning, and then the, a vital part of the relevance formula is that the academic knowledge is a vehicle, can be used as a vehicle for strengthening personal skills and development. They're not separate. If you're learning math in the classroom, you should also be learning how to learn. You should be learning how to solve problems. You should be learning how to work as a team. And you should be learning to communicate better. Okay, so it's not separate. separate. And as you do well in, with your personal skills and learning about the environment, it's a way to learn your academic knowledge better, and I talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. When I'm talking about learning, I'm talking about things like observation, discovery, reading and writing, inquiry, research, experimentation. Problem solving includes things like reasoning, assessment, analogy, critical thinking, judgment, comparison, organization. We're talking about teamwork, we're talking about things like negotiation, listening, leadership, also need good followership, planning, conflict resolution, and communication. We're talking about things like writing and speaking, questioning, whoops, sorry, listening, graphic representation, debate and dialogue, and then behaviors, cross-cutting behaviors, things like curiosity, confidence, perseverance, grit, respectfulness, creativity, risk tolerance and management, ambitiousness, 
et cetera. Okay, for those of you who read the entrepreneurship article, these things will be recognizable. All right. The idea is that learning, especially when we, you know, nowadays we talk about 21st century skills. And the idea that what you learn at school is not going to equip you fully for whatever employment you're going to have, especially when we're talking about kids in first, second, third grade who won't be entering the workforce for another 15, 20 years, hopefully. I mean, we're 2013, look back to 1993, what the workforce looked like back then, what technology looked like back then. I was telling Dan that I wrote my dissertation, my doctoral thesis, on a, I did have a computer with a 256 megabyte hard drive. <laughs> All right? So that was about 20 years ago. All right? Think of 20 years from now and whatever we were teaching our kids today, whatever technology we're teaching them on today, what the world's going to look like. All right. So we need to be able to think beyond what they need, what students have to learn to pass these tests and focus on these personal skills and local skills. And I know that this is very much in the, in the media in the United States right now. As, how many have read the Paul Tuff book? No, you don't do the Paul Tuff book? Read Paul Tuff. <laughs> He's where I learned about Angela Duckworth. It's, it's all about grit. All right. Um, so, on the thematic side, it's being able to draw from your local community, looking to local industry, agriculture, health, commerce, vaca uh, vocations, environment, different professions, ICT, volunteerism, transportation, child rearing, tourism, etc. Just anything, and when, you know, when you're talking about, re when I go around talking about relevance pedagogy, I'm talking to teachers in Africa, I'm talking to teachers in Central Asia, I'm talking to teachers in remote rural mountainous areas, in r lush agricultural areas, in urban settings. Thank you. Um, so, you don't go into a situation like that and say this is what I mean by relevance, this is what you should be doing. They need to be able to draw on the, the setting in which they find themselves to find this relevance. So in one place, they may go to a local mill or to a, a, a well or a spring, and another may go to a, a water treatment plant or to a major hydroelectric facility, all right? So it's whatever's in the setting, and getting this through to teachers sometimes is difficult because they, they think relevance, they think city, or they think global, and we need to be able to help them find a richness, a learning richness, even in the most sort of, um, uh, sort of intellectually barren settings. Okay. And there's experts, expertise, experience to be had in all of these settings. And teachers also, so one teacher may be interested in one thing, one teacher may be interested in another. So the ability to teach a geometry lesson, have one person go to a a construction site, another, per another person work with people, seamstresses or embroidery, other people going out into nature. This, is, this gets back to the opportunity for teachers to bring their own creativity to the mix. And at the national ministry level, you can't tell teachers, do this or do that. But you can create an, a, a, an opportunity and equip them with, with a you know, guidelines and training to help them make the decisions that will allow them to identify the right themes and the right opportunities to enrich their lessons. And then looking at the methodological side, 
we talk to teachers about bringing local experts into the classroom. And I'll give you just an illustration of this done poorly. The other day I was in a first grade class uh, and the teacher was uh, teaching, and this was in Tajikistan, and the teacher was teaching uh, lines. It was the first grade class teaching lines and intersections. And his expert was the math teacher. That's not what I have in mind by relevance. The math teacher came in with drawings on a piece of paper of squiggly lines, straight lines, circles, and had the kids identify it. And then for practical application, they had very nicely cut out pieces of string and went over to one of the tables and the two teachers held the strings for the students and had them point out the point of intersection. Now, I, when I met with the teacher afterwards, I applauded him for his initiative in bringing in an expert and for using the string, but I suggested that there might be alternatives. And this is where I talk about, uh, we're not criticizing what we're doing, we're finding opportunities to progress. Um, instead of a math teacher as an expert, he could have brought in a carpenter, a seamstress or an embroiderer, someone who does embroidery, um, a builder, a stonemason, Instead of using the strings, he could have had the teacher or the students identify in the classroom all of the lines and all of the points of intersection and made a game out of it. Okay, so this is, gets back to the notion that introducing the ideas is just the very start. And you need to work not on getting good ideas into the classroom, you need to get a, work on how to get the teachers using these good ideas in ways that are promoting learning. All right. So extracurricular activities, obvious. Um, class visits to sites in the community. Student research of local community dimensions, alone or in the groups of sending kids off to do research. Um, design and deliver lessons with local experts. Integrate content and te techniques from local context into classroom lessons and exercises and tests. I like to tell when we're doing the trainings, every teacher should spend at least five minutes a day or in every lesson doing something related to relevance just to draw the kids' attention to this and then many others. And Now, why does relevance pedagogy, why do I say relevance pedagogy, help strengthen ac students' academic capacity and performance? First of all, students get to feel, see, smell, hear, taste even, the abstract notions from their lessons and enabling them to learn from many different angles. Okay, and this is stuff that you've all learned. Um, students get to manipulate what they learn, both connect, concretizing and deepening their understanding of the abstract information and skills of their lessons. And students develop a greater sense of purpose in their studies, as do their parents, and therefore greater motivation and confidence to apply themselves. In Morocco, uh, one of the sort of uh, indicators of success that we weren't monitoring was at a school in, a, in the far east of the country, near the border with Algeria, where the director of the middle school told me that in that year's class he had, I think it was in the vicinity of 20, 20 or 30 kids who were completing their middle school studies and wanted to be oriented towards professional or vocational training rather than go on to the formal education school. And he, had, he said in all of his years in education before that, and he was about my age, so he'd been around for a while, he'd had maybe two or three students in all those years who had asked to be oriented towards vocational or technical. This is an, indica, indica, an indication of self-awareness and of commitment that the students develop by having the opportunity to see that education matters not just to succeed in education. Okay, some key observations around relevance pedagogy in Tajikistan from this recent, recent trip, and I'm condensing some stuff from 
the report that I made to my colleagues in Tajikistan. One, there was a lot of enthusiasm for it. Teachers were enthusiastic, school leaders, um, students, parents were all enthusiastic about the idea. There was greater learning and engagement by the students. It was more interesting, teachers found it more interesting and more fun for them more challenging, but more challenging in a good way. It relates to the Soviet experience, but with greater purpose and linked to local context. There was one school director who said that we did this during the Soviet period, but it was all about making it relevant to communism and what was coming out of Moscow. And now we're doing it in a way that has meaning for our own, our own societies, our own communities. And it links closely to the active learning pedagogy that we've been working on in the region for years now. And the challenge with active learning is, or one of many challenges with active learning, is that the curricula, the texts, and certainly the assessment methods are not conducive to active learning. So with the relevance we're giving a very concrete way for teachers to think about how to engage students in learning. I'll just give one illustration of a, a very neat lesson I heard about. It's a history lesson. They were studying World War II. And the teacher, following the curriculum, asked his students to go do individual or group projects. And one group, there are two that I remember, one group he asked, to go and interview people who, from the community who had fought in World War II. Where they had fought, what their experience was, what their impressions of it were, and all that. And then another group went to ask people who had remained in the community and asked them to get information on people's lived experience during World War II. So this very dry, abstract lesson in the textbook comes to life in the student's experience, and they can associate what they're reading in the official curriculum with what they're learning from their grandparents or their great uncles or neighbors or things like that. Some illustrative applications, I just mentioned one, so I got ahead of myself. Students' research and products, such as the one I just mentioned. Um, expert visits, they did have experts come in from, um, like a doctor come in and talk about the breathing system uh, and being able to discuss it in a way that teachers would not be able to discuss and answer questions. Um, the expert visits to a flour mill, to a hydroelectric plant, to the forest, and from doctors, traditional healers, carpenters, and the like. Uh, some more illustrative applications. It also opens up the opportunity for cross-disciplinary integration. So for example, in a Tajik, a Tajik language lesson, um, uh, describing a biology experiment that they had done. Uh, they had put flowers into water and were testing different, uh, which, which things that they put in the water would make the flowers last, stay fresh longer. Um, In-class illustrations, local foods, customs, professions. Um, link, again, it links closely to, to active learning pedagogy, putting together a skit. This is a picture of Rudaki, the, the uh, uh, founder of Tajik literature, uh, the father of Tajik literature. Um, extracurricular programs, of course, such as disaster preparedness clubs. And the Aga Khan Foundation does a lot around disaster preparedness. Key challenges, this is a teacher who was creating very unactive uh, group tasks for her class to do, but kept exhorting them to be active. Um, wide variations among teachers in terms of understanding of relevance pedagogy concepts. I talked about the teacher who invited the the math teacher is the expert. Uh, use of relevance pedagogy strategies varied widely. Interest, not everyone was as, was as interested in it. Limited range of relevance pedagogy strategies, even among accomplished teachers. This is, again, the notion that we're not criticizing, we're helping see where we are so we can move forward. And what do we need to do as Aga Khan, 
as the government agencies that we're working with um, to be able to help teachers move forward in a progressive way. And then poor mastery also of active learning methods. Okay, uh, many teachers seem to be slaves to the text, sort of shoehorning relevance into lessons. And the texts there are, at least the English ones, are just mind numbing. Um, and I was in these classes, I was in a 10th grade class and a 3rd grade class, they were both teaching about autumn, it, it was almost the exact same lesson. It was just tragic. And so they're following the texts. Uh, many teachers miss obvious opportunities to deepen relevance in their lessons. Some teachers seem to apply a checklist approach to relevance pedagogy. I'm going through these a little more quickly so that we can have more time to ask questions. If you want to come back to any of these, we can do so. No, it's, again, it's not a matter of failure, but an indication of where the program is and where we need to head. Okay, so how do we help teachers evolve? We develop, within this, we're developing a relevance pedagogy package. So teachers have something very clear and concrete to which they can refer. User-friendly, flexible, user-generated. We're using lesson, we're creating lesson plan templates that are prompting teachers to think broadly beyond the, their normal comfort zone. We're creating sample lessons or providing sample lessons with reflection questions and strategies for teachers to use. We're introducing a rigorous monitoring and evaluation protocol which is intended not just to provide us with information but to help teachers think about things that they haven't perhaps considered. And if you're going through a checklist and everything's no, 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 maybe you pause and say, geez, maybe I should be able to say yes to some of these things, All right? Frequent accountability, and we're hoping to build in IT, uh, especially mobile connectivity to help us do this. To inform, uh, the instruments should inform self-reflection, both individual and collective. And then fostering reflective practice and progress, building on key teachers, methodology days, and open lessons, things are already in, pra in practice. The real risk with coming up with a model like this and perfecting it and giving products is that teachers take the products as script. And the richness in the model is the originality that teachers will continue to bring to it. So it's sort of like, I did my undergraduate thesis on the Surrealist movement in Europe. And what my thesis was that the Surrealist movement died because it was all about disrupting convention. And when people started paying a lot of money for the art, it became convention. So it sort of imploded on its own philosophy. And there's a real risk in bringing innovation in, too, that gets developed as a process and that gets concretized uh, or, um, what's the word? Uh, well, I'll, say, I'll just leave it at concretized, as a product that loses the opportunity to evolve or take shape in individual teachers' hands. So communities of practice, we're talking about four levels. Okay, this is giving the teachers the opportunity to take ownership of it. Each teacher alone and with colleagues should be able to think reflectively. We have something called lesson study, which is a model that comes from Japan, where teachers sort of observe each other, but they also create the lesson together. So they're not observing the teacher, they're observing the practice and commenting on the practice afterwards, and I can talk more about that later if you'd like. Then school reflection workshops, so the teachers get together and take action research as their normal way of operating. And then doing the same thing at a cluster level. We provide guidelines for this, we're providing monitoring tools for this, and we're providing reflection opportunities on this as well. So the community of practice is something that we're evolving in the doing as well. So in all four settings, we want teach or in, yeah, in all four settings, we want teachers to think critically about their practice and to work to improve it by observing and analyzing what they're doing, 
by consulting and comparing among themselves, by de devising and experimenting with new solutions, and to do this on a continuous basis. Dealing with things like slower learners, how to deal with slower learners, classroom management, continuous assessment, specific lessons or content, specific techniques they've been using, and other things. So they're thinking about this all the time, not in a checklist way, but in a way that is being perpetuated. And they're doing this alone and together, and they're doing it continuously. Okay? It's a burden for them, it's extra work. They will do it if Having them continuously thinking allows them at the same time to have some authority over what they're doing, okay? You cannot give someone responsibility if you don't also give them authority, okay? And expect change. Um, this is, there's someone whom I discovered recently, uh, Michelle Schweisferth at University of Glasgow. She talks about sifting, whoops, sifting the local from the global, all right? It's, you know, there are these great ideas, we need to make them relevant to where we are. Okay, so in conclusion, we can create all the models, inputs, standards, policies, research, experimentation, technology, et cetera, that we want. And we can provide all the training and monitoring and guides and tools and materials, mentoring, incentives, et cetera, that we can. But we must ensure these all equip, permit, and encourage teacher to use these in ways that are effective, appropriate, balanced, creative, varied, flexible, adapted, et cetera, to their particular environments. Okay? We must liberate teachers' creativity and initiative. And thank you. Okay, well, there's a lot of food for thought here. Uh, I hope you all feel liberated, suitably liberated. And now you are liberated to ask uh, questions. Uh, may I ask that you identify yourself in your program uh, when I call on you? Is there a first? Sorry. Uh, <coughs> question, comment? Yes, please. Um, my name is Rachel Jordan, and I'm from the International Education Development Program. I was curious. Uh, you spoke about teachers going from teacher school uh, into these isolated classroom environments, and a lot of your writing uh, is about programs that you ever saw in Morocco, but you've also been in contexts where teachers have um, much more basic education, uh, only through primary school, or maybe very limited pedagogical training. So how would you adapt um, this relevancy program mm -hmm. uh, for teachers that maybe are still struggling even to have a full understanding of the content they're teaching. Right. right. One way to, uh, those teachers need help. And you can't, you can't just bring this in and say it's going to work equally well in every place. And that's where that's why I combine a presentation on communities of practice with relevance pedagogy. Um, you cannot introduce relevance pedagogy in a top-down, cascade, parachute way any more than you can any other innovation. And we, what we did in Morocco and what we're doing in, in Tajikistan as well now is starting with the teachers that can get it from the beginning and using this as a way to 
I, I can see, and I haven't worked on this directly, but I can see this being a way to help teachers who have poor content knowledge get better content knowledge. So for example, if you have a teacher who knows two plus two equals four, but really can't go any further than that, the ability to bring in a carpenter who maybe can't add two plus two, but can do it, um, can help that teacher evolve in her or his own, uh, own mastery of the content. Um, it's a way to bring in other resources to compensate for what you cannot do. I mean, this first grade teacher doing the lines was a very good example of someone who, he, I think he has enough math to teach grade one, or um, to know more about math than his grade one students, but not necessarily more to be able to teach it to his grade one students. So it's, it's not an answer to those sorts of issues, but I think that it is a model that can help compensate for some of these shortcomings and help people who have the interest to strengthen their, their own knowledge. The first is that I noticed that you had um, critical thinking skills as a component in the relevant pedagogy piece. I was wondering how you would inculcate that in teachers, given that they're a product of the same education system that they later go on to join. Um, the second part to my question is that a single classroom can have different skill levels mm -hmm. in students. How do you deal with that in a classroom, like, in, in classrooms that could vary in size from 50 students to 60 in the different countries, as is the case? And the third is that teachers come in with their own biases or ingrained impressions um, that could be cultural, for example, related to gender or in India as it is in caste. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with issues like that? Right. Um, I'm going to ask you to help me remember your three questions. <laughs> okay, tell me the first one again. Um, the first one was the critical thinking. Okay. Um, you're right. Not everyone's equipped for critical thinking. And you know, there's some teachers who aren't going to get it. What I feel, what I argue very strongly in a lot of the countries where I work is that we can't let ourselves be held back by the, the people who can't do it. And a lot of times we try to introduce, the, the introduction of, of innovation is stymied by the fact that not everyone can do it. And so they don't let anyone do it. You can't do it or will do it? Both. Both. Do you um, know the difference? Sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure that the difference matters. Um, I don't know about that. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll get, hold that question. Hold that thought. <laughs> um, the, I mean, well, I'll get to your question in a second. So, but the critical thinking is, it's not something that you can't learn later in life. And the ability to think critically isn't just a skill. It's, a, it's an environment. It's a context. And I remember a colleague of mine in Cambodia talking about community participation in schooling. And she was telling student, or telling parents, she was in front of a group of parents saying, you should go to the school and find the problems with the schools and make suggestions on what to do differently. And she said it was like staring into the eyes of a deer looking at an oncoming, oncoming car. You know, think of Cambodia, these people's experience was you couldn't criticize anything without getting in, be, being at risk of ending up in the killing fields. Right? So the, I, I like to look at these things in an evolutionary way and say, let's start with the people who get it, and then let's bring on the other people. And getting to Dan's point, I've had, when I talk about the cynics, and I usually say ignore the cynics, I've had people who bristle at that. And I, I take their point. 
because the cynics, one, they deserve to the, have the opportunity also to evolve in their own practice, and they can make problems for the others. So it's, it's, I sort of say it to shock people, but I, I agree that we can't just leave the people who can't do it, either because they can't or because they don't want to. They're part of it, but we need to, we need to get momentum first, and then there's a different strategy often for the other groups that we need to, who can't do it or don't want to do it. And I, I guess, I just want to make sure that we don't get bogged down in getting everybody progressing it the same way. Because as students, you know, I have many friends who really think of two or three good teachers they had in their whole lifetime, and the rest were cretins. But they evolved because they were sufficiently motivated by a handful of teachers. And we don't, we want every teacher to be an excellent teacher, but quite, my feeling is we don't need every teacher to be an excellent teacher for students to have the opportunity to learn and to evolve. And sometimes you really want your students to have at least a couple, or your ch children, to have a couple <laughs> teachers who are really hard to get along with because they're gonna, deal with these people in life, and that's part of their education. You know, a lot of talk now in the press about uh, children needing to, needing not to succeed, needing to experience failure, to overcome it, to learn those skills as well. So the critical thinking is critical, but it's, it can be learned, but it's not just a matter of learning it, and we need to bring people on at a pace that, that they can handle um, and let the others carry the load for a little bit. And your second question. Actually, I'm going to jump in and then move to another person. Um, because okay. we may get back a second back to the but One second. I want to just pursue the point that you very gracefully slipped off of. <laughs> <laughs> because I do think that it's relevant. I and mean, when, you know, if, um, I was um, saying in my introduction of you, many positive things. <laughs> I still believe those things. If I was sitting in the audience and I had a teacher who was very energetic and very smart, having many good ideas, nonetheless, there is a part of my head as a teacher that would say, you're asking me to change my behavior. And it's not that I can't do it. Mm -hmm. It's that I don't know why I should do it. Mm -hmm. and why should I do it for you? Why? I mean, so the difference between can and will, in my view, is a very big difference. Mm -hmm. And so there, I mean, we may at one level in this room say, oh, your idea is a good idea. But what would I have to do? I have to find a carpenter to come into my class? I'd rather get out a piece of string. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right. How do you respond to that? People need to come to things at their own pace. And we need to create motivation for people to do that. And like I was saying, I don't know if I talked, did I talk about idealists and empiricists here? Or was that at lunch? Okay, so that was at lunch, okay. So that's the, that's a glitch in your <laughs> system. Okay, so I like to talk about four categories of people when you're talking about change, and I don't know if Fulling covers this or not. You've got the idealists who are convinced by the idea. Okay, they say, that sounds great, I'd love to try it. Okay, and you work, in my mind, you start with them, because they're the easiest group to start with, and you need to get an early success. And also, those are the people who are gonna help you tweak the model, or create the model. In Morocco, we really created the model with these idealists, All right? We didn't come in and say, here's what we do in the States, or here's what we did in Guatemala, you should do it here. We came in and said, here's what we want to try to do. Here in the national education reform is where it says this is what you should be doing. We will help you do this. And we found the most creative, excited teachers to start developing that. And we learned with them what works, what doesn't work. 
Okay, then we addressed ourselves to the empiricists. The empiricists are the ones who want to see that this works. Right? So we began with the idealists and got some successes, and the others said, oh, pretty cool. And sometimes it was they themselves, and other times it was their students coming to them and saying, you should see what we did with, with Mr. Benjaloon in our class. It was really cool. And then the teacher goes and talks to Mr. Benjaloon, says, what did you do? Your students are really excited about this. Okay, so we go to the empiricists, the cynics, I said, let's ignore, but Dan's point I embrace entirely, and then the sheep will follow. Okay, the largest number is the sheep. Wherever the rest are going, we'll follow. Okay, two points. One, we need to take people as they come and get them excited for whatever motivates whatever floats their boat, so to speak. And two, let we, I was very rigorous about not getting hung up on not every teacher's doing it. And I, to my mind, that's a big failure of a lot of systems. So okay, that's my view. Uh, one, two, three. Let's take three questions, yes. Yeah, right here. Oh, first of all, uh, in your article, I would like to thank you because I'm Moroccan and, and your name uh, I is? talk about yeah. Amal. And then I'm an IDP student. Okay. I'm from Morocco. And uh, when I was doing the readings, I really liked them because uh, as a Moroccan, I'm torn between the public discourse of everyone that our system of education is a disaster and the official political one, which, we, which is we're doing great. Uh, almost achieved the MDG for education for all. It doesn't mean anything. Right. Uh, so it was very good to see a perspective that shows that there are problems, but there are ways to, I mean, to work on them and to make things better. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. My question is, as much as I like what you presented, I feel like still, at least in my country, public schools are still considered as a political tool, mm -hmm. tool to manufacture consent. So being diverse is not what the state really wants. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though they promote your, I mean, decentralization and making teachers more sovereign, when it comes to the fact that they really still hold control of everything. To what extent do you think that countries are really to trade off their mm -hmm. own power in order to make teachers more sovereign? Mm -hmm. Why preserving, I mean, some kind of centralized? Mm -hmm. How sorry. Okay, sorry. Did you finish? Yeah. Okay, you, they're going to need to remind me. I'll remind you. Okay, very good. <laughs> I um, don't know. I was thinking about the term that you introduced in the entrepreneurship article. And about you are? Karen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> from, so. Thank you. Um, and in the, the term vocational maturity, and I was thinking about it um, in my personal experience when I was in school and how things have sort of gone many different ways and um, what could have done better in that case or worse. And, having friends, male friends that wanted to go into the arts. And, um, my point is, how could, it, how could it be part of this program um, to introduce that for all those children that are still exploring to not feel like um, they, they have to know, come 18 years old, what right. they want to do and, and be immature if they don't feel what they want right. to try and see. Right. Yep. Yeah. OK. Um, I think it was a third. You are? I'm Adam Sachs, also a uh, master's in international education development. Mm -hmm. um, my question is a little bit about uh, the, the after. The, uh, you talked a little bit about um, not making sure that the system doesn't become too concrete. Right. I'm wondering, before that even happens, in the Morocco example in, in your paper, you mentioned that once a new administration came in, the program was actually stopped. Right. Um, how do you, what methods or what uh, what efforts do you make to keep it going in spite of uh, changes in administration or in spite of outside influences? Yeah. How do you keep relevance and pedagogy going or other projects going as well? Yeah. Okay, so maybe you can answer the, sort of the two Morocco questions first. Okay, we're going with the first one. The first one was, it's all politics. Oh, all right. Morocco, yeah. 
It's all politics. Yeah, right. In spite of your emphasis on heterogeneity and so on. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. I. One, in Morocco, I actually found a lot of openness. Um, the, we even got the Department of Evaluation, when they ran the tests, to help us come up with a model for assessing relevance in learning. Right? But you need to work in the structures. The teacher training uh, the structure, the pre-service teacher training structure, took it on. Right? But the, it, the leadership matters a lot. And if you can get stable leadership, you've got a real, a real leg up on it. We did a girls' dormitory program in Morocco that we worked with Entraide Nationale, which is in the Ministry of Social Affairs, and a sort of a semi-autonomous group. And they work, they run half the dormitories in the country, the Ministry of Education runs the other half. We made almost no headway with the Ministry of Education in the, girls, in the dormitories, girls and boys dormitories. We went nationwide with the Entraide Nationale dormitories because the leadership bought it and because we were answering a priority for them. Okay. The, we did the project in Morocco in four regions. It was uh, Shawi Wardiga, Casa, Casablanca, Meknes de Filalet, and Oriental, for those of you who know. In the second to last year, we started working with Rabat and with, where's Benny Milan? <laughs> Which region? <laughs> yes, there. <laughs> <laughs> And we didn't bring any resources to it. There, they came to us and said, we want this to happen. And the dynamics of the project completely changed because we were helping them meet their priorities rather than they're waiting on this USAID funding project to do things. Um, so it, I, I'm not sure that you can system proof a program like this but you you try to come at it from all the angles you can and try to get leverage where you can the 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 relevance pedagogy well the the entrepreneurial tr spirit training i think still continues in some of the districts where we were using it it just didn't make it into the national system. The relevance pedagogy got bogged down because there was a competing project um, that the ministry brought on because they bought into this model out of Belgium, and so that got bogged down. But our work with uh, communities, the school plans, nationalized. The work with the uh, girls' dormitories, nationalized. Our work on IT, nationalized. And the, the literacy that we did with Dan got a lot of headway, unfortunately got bogged down because of the politics in that sector, but too. I but, it, of that, but, it, we were, but there are a lot of luck. I mean, leadership matters. So we yeah. happened upon um, a leader who took the issue of the Amazir right. language, the Berber language, seriously. And he did not block it like almost right. every other leader would. No, we did, we, with Dan, we were able to do something that was almost unimaginable a year before, which was get the head of the Amazek Institute together with the head of literacy and come to an agreement. And the head of literacy, you know, he was very open with this about, this was Biru, um, about the fights he was going to have to have at the minister's council. And they basically told us it was impossible, and then right. they didn't. And, and what, and, but yeah, what we, thing. but he guided us in what evidence we needed to provide him to be armed to do that. It's very interesting. Vocational maturity. Um, the, the, uh, let me just give a little illustration of the sort of thing that I, that I think we need to be able to pay attention to. We are, one of the classes I visited in, in Morocco, oh, I'm sorry, in Tajikistan a couple weeks ago. The teacher, in a very relevant way, told the students, go home and write what profession you would like to be when you grow, practice when you grow up. 
and you know, thinking ahead, and that's great. And I said to her, you know, you've missed an opportunity. First of all, these kids are what, 12, 13 years old? They don't really know yet. Why don't you instead have them in groups of two or three go and interview two or three different people? together. And before you do that, in, in their tables, because there's small classes there, in their tables, have them come up with questions that they would ask. Because all the teachers do is give closed questions, and the kids are supposed to uh, come to agreement on this. And have them discuss what are the questions, and then bat it around in the classroom. What do you want to find out from a profession that would give you an idea of your interest in it? And then come back and have them present. Okay, so rather than this very narrow activity you're working on negotiation, you're working on creativity, you're working on communication, uh, investigation, um, you're learning about a variety of professions, and then send them home after this process is done and have them write that paragraph for you about what you want to be when you grow up. So it's, it's opening the kids up to this notion that there's a world out there that they are preparing for and that they have no idea about, and they also need to know themselves better. So a lot of the entrepreneurial spirit program was about um, self-discovery and having other people say, I think what I admire about you is, and what I think you're not so good at is. Um, the, one of the early motivations behind my thinking and relevance pedagogy, which dates back to my dissertation, was helping kids and parents alike understand that school matters even if you're going to stay in your village. And that's really important for girls' education as well. Because schooling is all about the ticket out. And as parents start to realize that schooling matters even if you stay in the village, then they start making very different decisions for their boys and their girls. In, I did an evaluation many years ago of the Save the Children uh, Community Schools Project in Mali. And I, I don't have any evidence of this, um, but my hypothesis is that a lot of the success of the Save the Children Community School Project, which was all in Bambara, was that they had preceded it with a women's literacy program in Bambara. So that the mothers started to perceive all the benefits they got from learning to read and write in Bambara. So that they, when, it was, when Save the Children then came to them and said, we would like to think about training your kids in local language, they understood that this has benefits to them even if they don't go on to schooling, to university, and end up being some lawyer or politician or airplane pilot. I hope that and gets to it. We have time for a couple more questions. Uh, one, number two, number three. Let's see if we can do it fairly quickly. Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Susan Schaefer Davis. I'm an anthropologist and I've worked a lot in North Africa, especially in Morocco. And I was wondering if you have any ideas find your uh, reading so I get my hands on them too. But in the project you did in Morocco, I know there was this literacy aspect in Amazigh, a local language, and the other non-Amazigh Moroccans talk something they don't go to school in either, to Asia, mm -hmm. uh, right. Arabic. How does learning, at least to start, in your local language relate to relevance education, relevance pedagogy? Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so okay. I, that one I'll remember. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. Um, Alkian, I am a second year master's student in international education development. Um, my question is probably a bit political as well. Um, as you may know, a lot of Central Asian countries follow Russia's trends in terms of education. So after Soviet Union, we started developing these standardized tests for uh, basically the entire region. And a lot of them come from Russia. Mm -hmm. And um, although contextualization is wonderful and promotes you know, local knowledge and things like that, how do you navigate the waters of this Russian type of an exam that has very little contextualization except for maybe history and the, the Tajik language or Kazakh mm -hmm. language or whatever, and then deal with the contextualization where it's great for the student but not, not necessarily useful 
for the test and then going on to higher education. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good question. Um, thank you, you for the presentation. Yeah. And I'm Sakima Azara, a uh, uh, second year PhD student at NGSE. Uh, I have several questions, but I think some, like, one. one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. So <laughs> I will ask one. Uh, given, like, I appreciate the holistic approach that the relevance pedagogy has. And I understand why it is like this. Coming from Bangladesh, I'm a Bangladeshi, and I have experience in the education system there. And I worked in an educational project this summer. And since I was interested in evaluating the project, my question to you would be: since in this the process of you know, like evaluating the students, you talk about uh, that testing would inform their personal skills and vice versa, like how they would be interacting. I feel mm -hmm. um, how would you ensure that? Like, and as a part of that question, like, since I didn't hear about any monitoring system that was in place, like, how does it actually work? Mm -hmm. How does the monitoring work, or how does the program? Uh, how, does how do you know it works? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Think of it in order. Right. I think I can combine the. Take about an hour to answer. Well, <laughs> you uh, we only have a few minutes. Okay. We're almost out of time. The. Let me try to situate. Just say your question one more time for so me. So Russian, well, not Russian, but okay. Russianized. Oh, testing. and the testing. Okay. The what I said in here, and I believe it firmly, is that relevance is learning things about your local context is not a replacement for relevant or for learning the material, and. You know, we still need to monitor to see that it's actually happened, that what I believe will be the case actually is the case. Um, there's other research that suggests strongly that if you learn things in a relevant manner, you will perform better on the test. And this is what we found in Morocco, at the middle school level at least, that the kids on the high stakes tests were performing better in the experiment schools and in the control schools. And there were a lot of interventions that our project was doing, not just relevance, that would, could help account for this. So it's hard to say that it's, to what degree relevance was contributing to it. But, you know, just looking to, you know, cognitive sciences and how you learn and the variety of ways that people learn, the, the relevance is lastly about content, okay? It's lastly about what are the foods that we produce locally. It's firstly about what are the skills that we need to be able to learn things and to be able to take our academic knowledge and use it in a way that is motivating, engaging, and meaningful for us. So it's not two plus two as a calculation, it's two plus two as a task or as a project that we need to complete, okay? So if you're learning about World War II and need to remember those dates and those places, the ability to link that to some story that your grandfather told you about his own experience in it is going to set that more solidly in your, in your uh, knowledge, in your ability to recover it. And hopefully also make it more motivating to learn the dry facts that you're gonna need for doing this. Um, as far as monitoring and evaluation, we monitor the learning and use the tests to show whether we're making a difference, or our own tests that we that we uh, develop for you know reporting to donors and stuff like that. Um, but what we're also monitoring is what teachers are doing. You know how what are the, what, what experts they're bringing in, how they're using the experts, what methods they're using, how much time they're devoting to it, where they go. Um, and we're trying to work on how you measure things like curiosity, confidence, um, teamwork. And there are a lot of people working on this now, including folks, I was at a conference last January, folks associated with Microsoft and Intel who are working on this, um, these, measuring these 21st century skills things. 
So, you know, you're asking the right questions. I'm not equipped right now to say definitively, here's the evidence, but th I'm drawing by analogy other research that gives me confidence that what we're saying makes a difference. Uh, intuitively, it makes sense. And I know for a fact that the employers are looking for something more than being people who do well on tests. And as far as language, are, are, Susan, are you asking the question about adult literacy or about how those issues relate to school level relevance and the like? Well, I don't know if you look at in your, your wide range of work, people learning in local languages as mm -hmm. opposed to national languages you mentioned on the Yeah. And is that part of relevance pedagogy? Does it tie into it? For, for, for me, it's very much a part of relevance pedagogy. And the first relevance pedagogy project I did was in Ethiopia in the mid-90s. Mid-90s? No, early 2000s. Um, and it was a project called Popular Participation in Curriculum and Instruction. This was in Ethiopia where there were all these different languages. And you asked a local expert to come in and they did not speak Amharic and the teachers often didn't speak the local language so you had to find some way of, of figuring out how to make that transition between the teacher and the expert um, but the students can often play that role and the you know, we were talking about this in Mombasa as well where we're in Kiswahili working in Kiswahili and in in um, English, but there are a lot of other local languages and we're trying to encourage parents to read to kids before they come to school. And what books can we give to them to allow them to be able to do it? So it's a very, it's a very important issue. It's one that we are working on. We don't have all the answers, but it's, it's something that uh, in the context where we operate, it's, it's vitally important for us yes, to pay attention to. Are there movements? Uh around the world to get people using the local language to read to their kids and stuff to start out that way or isn't there movements like that? <sighs> know, yes. does, room, does room to read to it? Yeah. Plenty now. Yeah. Uh, including in Morocco. But uh, I think we're going to have to stop there because people are going to have to run at four. Uh, let me thank you one more time. Sure. And let me also say that uh, Josh has agreed to stay back for a few minutes. Those of you who haven't had a chance to meet him would like to introduce yourself. You are welcome to do so. Let's thank him again for the most interesting, the most interesting and relevant. <laughs> <laughs>